thank you everyone and thank you DuPont. I love to talk about diversity and it's important and it should be important to you because our culture has changed. You've probably all heard the old expression that America is a melting pot. And what that meant was that wherever you were from, whoever you were, you came to the United States, we sort of threw you into one pot and sort of simmered away all of your differences and we all came out Americanized. The more modern expression now though is that America is no longer a melting pot but if in fact a salad bowl. And the reason it's called a salad bowl because if you look at the actual elements of a salad, none of the pieces of the salad look like anything else. The carrot doesn't look like the radish, the radish doesn't look like the cucumber, the cucumber doesn't look like the tomato. You can see every element of the salad for what it really is. And most of us would agree that a salad that has all of these different things is a better salad. What does diversity look like though? When, when I talk about diversity, a lot of people tend to think racial and ethnic diversity, and that's important, and I think we're going to you know, talk about that too. But it's more than that. I think diversity comes in many forms. This is just my list, but let's take a look at it. Gender. Men are different from women, and all kidding aside, it really is true. We operate totally differently. What about religious differences? That's probably never been quite as much in the media as it is right now. Age and generational differences. The boomers are very different from the matures who are different from Gen X or Gen Y. The gay and lesbian market. Physical abilities. Those who have physical challenges are going to face certain things that people who don't have physical challenges don't face. What about rural versus metro? Someone who lives in a rural area is going to be very different than someone who lives in Manhattan. And political beliefs. What about even military versus civilian? Those are two totally different worlds. And of course, racial, white, African American, Asian and Native American, but also ethnic and linguistic differences. For example, Hispanic is not a race, it's an ethnicity, or Asian Indian. Nativity, I think someone who's foreign born is gonna look at the United States with a very different lens than someone who's US born. Life stage, a new mom or a new dad is going to be in a very different place emotionally, financially, priority-wise than someone who's a retiree, someone who's a college student, or someone who's an empty nester. Lifestyle and affluence. You know, the working poor are very different from the middle class who are different from the wealthy. And what about core values? You know, someone who's a hardcore environmentalist or a vegan or a vegetarian or someone who homeschools their child is going to be different than someone who doesn't homeschool their child. Those are core values that can reflect the way that you do business. And there's even diversity within diversity. This is a chart of the US Asian composition. And if you look at this chart, you can see that, you know, there's not even a common language among these different groups, much less alone common foods or traditions or holidays, and yet we lump them into all one group, call it Asian. Same thing with Hispanic. With Hispanic, at least there's a common language, that being Spanish. But again, someone who's Cuban is going to have different foods, different holidays, different traditions than someone who's Venezuelan or someone who's Mexican. And in the United States right now, one in nine people are foreign born. One in nine. Also, for the first time ever, the composition of the workforce in the US is equal between men and women. That's never happened before. There have always been more men in the US workforce than women up until last year. I believe that understanding someone who's different from you, whether it's a coworker inside your shop or whether it's your customer base, is less about focusing on their race or the shape of their eyes, the color of their skin, and more about the experiences that define them and make them them. That's what really defines all of us. So to really kind of drive this home, you can try this exercise on your own or with your staff sometime. You can ask the same question of three different groups and get totally different answers based on their perspective. When asked to name how Kennedy died, matures and baby boomers will say a gunshot wound in Dallas. Gen X will say a plane crash in Martha's Vineyard. And Gen Y will say, Kennedy who? <laughs> so let me quickly take you through four different generations. For the first time ever in the United States, there are four generations of Americans working side by side together. And that is the matures, the boomers, Gen X, and Gen Y. And I'll take you through some major cultural icons and, uh, and emotional drivers. Let's start with the matures. Those are the people who are in this country who are defined as those uh, age 65 and older. The iconic entertainer for this generation was Frank Sinatra. The household income was about 40 grand, and the defining idea for this generation was duty. Duty to God, duty to country, duty to family, duty to neighbor, duty to friend. Dutiful, and you, I'm a team player, because how can I be dutiful if you can't count on me? 
Work is an inevitable obligation. Not necessarily a chore or drudgery, but this is not the generation that job hopped very much. You often had the guy who went to work for the collision shop or the insurance company, and 35 years later, he retired and got the gold watch and the retirement party. So they didn't job hop a lot, and work was simply something that you did to support yourself and your loved ones. Education was a dream for this generation. Why? Because financial aid had not yet been invented, so it was not an opportunity for everyone. And you reward yourself because you've earned it. Delayed gratification. Home stuff, Timex, milk and cookies. Why milk and cookies? Because mom was there to make them. She was a full-time homemaker, and her job was to take care of the kids, and so she was able to make milk and cookies for us. And the philosophy on money was to put it away and pay cash, and it's best not to owe money to anyone. Family, traditional nuclear. And technology, slide rules and rotary phones. Now compare that then with the boomers. The boomers are age 46 to 64. The iconic entertainer for this generation, Mick Jagger. Pretty different from Frank Sinatra, wouldn't you say? I love Mick, but I call him the dancing skeleton. Yes, I think he needs a cheeseburger. Household income skyrockets to about $60,000 for this generation, the most affluent generation ever in American history. And defining idea for this generation, individuality. Team me, the me show, starring me, with special guest star, me. But enough about me, what do you think of me? And that's because we're self-absorbed. And I, say, I put myself in this group, I am a boomer, and that's not a comment or a criticism, it's just, it is the way it is. We've been pretty self-absorbed, we've had it pretty good in our lives. And that's also because work is an exciting adventure. When we got out of school, the economy was robust, the market was robust, it was pretty easy for us to get ahead professionally. And also, in one generation, education moved from being a dream to being a birthright with the advent of financial aid. You reward yourself not because you've earned it. No, 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 you deserve it. And home stuff, Casio, milk, and Oreos. Why Oreos? Because mom went back to work, right? She's not there to make the cookies anymore. Money, buy now, pay later. Hello, MasterCard. Family, disintegrating. Highest divorce rate ever in American history, then and now. And technology, calculators, and touchtone phones. So we start to see the beginning of, of technology. Generation X, age 33 to 45, iconic entertainer for this generation, Madonna. Household income, about 50 grand. And defining idea, diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, first generation ever in America to never live through the civil rights movement and not know segregation. So they don't know anything except diversity. They have grown up with diverse playgrounds and diverse schoolyards all of their lives. Style, entrepreneur. Why? Because work is a difficult challenge. Remember for this generation, dot bomb, dot gone, WorldCom, Enron. A lot of people of this generation saw their family, their friends, their loved ones, their parents, maybe themselves, lose their jobs for no fault of their own because they, their business has just imploded. So consequently, entrepreneur, because the only person you can trust is yourself. Education is a way to get there, and you reward yourself because you need it. Home stuff, their watch of choice was Swatch. And their cookies, milk and snack wells, because they were very much uh, part of the whole heightened awareness of food and nutrition. They're the ones who coined the term working out. And they're the ones who coined the term running. We used to exercise, now we work out. We used to jog, now we run. Money, cautiously conservative. Their philosophy is to save, 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 because you never know when the rug can be pulled out from under you again. And family, latchkey kids. They're children of divorce. Many of them were raised by a single parent, and that parent couldn't necessarily be home at 3.30 in the afternoon to meet them. So they learned to be uh, very resourceful and do for themselves. And technology, spreadsheets, and cell phones. And lastly, Generation Y, age 19 to 32. This is sort of a strange little generation because some of them are 30, you know, in their 30s and they are working and starting families, and some of them are still living at home in their parents' basements. But nevertheless, the iconic entertainer for this generation is the Black Eyed Peas. Not probably because the music is so iconic, but because the band itself actually represents the diversity that this generation knows, both racially, ex ethnically, and also gender-wise within the band. They control $160 billion in spending, and the defining idea for this generation is authenticity. Why? Because they've had the internet in their bedroom since they were five years old. They're very worldly and sophisticated. And work is a chance to do some good. They're very conscious of companies and, their, and what they do in the community. Education is an incredible expense. Not necessarily not worth it, but this is really the first generation who's ever even questioned it in the first place. You know, they're just looking at this and kind of going, $80,000 in student loans? I don't know if that's really going to be worth it. 
Re reward yourself because you can share it with your friends. Their friends and their social network means everything to them. Home stuff, they don't even use watches. They use their cell phones to tell time. And it's all about their gadgets, their iPods, their Wii, and organic foods. Money, their philosophy is to earn it to spend it. And family, merged families. Their definition of family is the only one that really matters. Many of this generation were, were raised by step-parents, grandparents, gay and lesbian parents. Doesn't matter. Your definition of family is how you define it. And technology, all access, text messaging, and for this generation, now means right now, like right this second. There's no waiting. So why does diversity matter for your business? Because frankly, your long-term survival depends on it. As Harry mentioned, it's business evolution. It's not just that our communities are changing. Your customers are changing right along with those communities, and so is your workforce. Diversity affects every aspect of your business. I want to give you a quick peek into the future, though. The peek into the future, I want to talk a little bit more about Generation Y and the Hispanic market. We value all diverse segments. We care about all diverse segments. I'm singling these two groups out, though, because they are the largest groups of population that are happening in the United States right now, and we can't ignore that. So I want to dive a little bit more into these. So let's talk about the Gen Y market. Obviously, these are your customers, but increasingly, these are your coworkers and your labor force as well. Businesses are drooling over Gen Y. They're 70 million strong. They're second only to the baby boomers in size as the largest population in the United States. And they are projected to be the wealthiest generation in American history. Despite our current economic conditions, they are expected to recover from this. They've got a lifetime to recover from this. And they are going to be very wealthy. And they are our future workforce. They're also your future customers. And Generation Y is unique. They're very diverse. One in three in this generation is not white. One in four lives in a single parent household. And their media habits have changed significantly. As I mentioned, now means right now, right this second. And they're more connected than any generation has ever been. They're not just connected to their friends. They're connected to the world and to the news. Their media influences have shaped this. They've had more information in their bedrooms all of their lives than you can find in the Library of Congress. The digital world that they live in provides anonymity. And what that allows them is the freedom to express themselves about everything online. And guess what? They bring that same expression of themselves to work. New gaming systems every Christmas made them adaptable to new technology. They're not afraid of new technology. They love learning new things. Phone calls gave way to texting. And they have been trained to multitask and not focus. You can give a Gen Y employee 15 things to do, and they'll get them done. But when you give them one big task to focus on, they actually struggle with that, and this is why. So opportunities for service repair with this generation is to provide education and advice about what this generation needs to know to maintain their vehicle. Generation Y is actually more likely to seek information from their fellow uh, friends and referrals than anywhere else. And here's what they care about. When they look to you for information, they care about a demonstrated commitment to diversity, and they care about green efforts and community involvement. In fact, one verbatim from a focus group had a, had a kid in this group who said, I think companies should help people. That was his view of business. Companies should help people. And they expect personalized everything because they've had personalized everything, from the ringtones on their cell phones to getting their computers configured exactly the way they want them. So if you are working with people of this group and they are uh, dealing with computer screens at work, they should have personalized computer screens that when they log on to their account, says, hi, Kelly. Some of the don'ts in terms of marketing to this group don't utilize traditional marketing techniques to reach Gen Y because, frankly, they're not there. Don't try to be hip or cool. One of the biggest things that people, uh, mistakes that people make is trying to hippify their marketing efforts to this group or make it really cool. And frankly, what this group wants is just clear information, easy to understand language. And they don't respond to high pressure sales tactics of any kind. They see right through that. They'd rather have education and information. And that don't underestimate the power of their social network. You know, respond to every question, no matter how small and petty it might seem to you. Now, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Hispanic market, because the Hispanic market is el futuro. It is the future of our country. And uh, when USA Today came out with these numbers that for the first time ever, the nation's minority numbers had topped 100 million, then what they looked at was, where's the growth coming from? And the Hispanic population was, was responsible for more than half of that growth. 
I'm excited about the next census, folks. That's going to be published in February. And we're going to see updated information. And you're going to see in the next 90 days how truly diverse this country has become. But as we look at the Hispanic population in the United States, one way to frame it for you is to think of it as a country within a country. There are 48.7 million Latinos in the United States. And if you're anything like me, intellectually, I know that that's a large number. But I have to have a framework for it to get my head around how large it is. So let me give you some context. That now makes the United States the second largest Hispanic country in the world. More context. There are more Latinos living in the United States than there are Canadians in Canada. And the Hispanic population is the fastest growing ethnic group in the United States. When you look at the trend, too, you really can't ignore this. this is pie, these are pie charts that show the composition of the United States. And all populations will continue to grow in size over the next decade. But when we look at the composition, look at the changes here, you can see that the yellow slice of the pie is the white population. And the white population is the majority population in this country, and it will continue to be so for the next several decades. But look at how that declines percentage-wise over the next 10 years. It drops by five full percentage points. Hispanic, which is the red slice, grows by four per percentage points. African American stays the same at about 14%, and Asian grows slightly. The only real shift in composition of the United States, folks, is a declining white population as a percentage of the whole, and a growing Hispanic population as a percentage of the whole. The top 10 Hispanic markets in this country are these. And there are probably not a whole lot of surprises on this list. It's pretty much what you would expect. California, Arizona, Texas markets, et cetera. Um, but you know, this, this is not a list that would surprise you, but this is a list that might surprise you. This is a list of the fastest growing Hispanic markets in the country. They're by no means the, the largest, but the fastest growing. And five of the top 15 on this list here are in North Carolina. I mean, these are pretty untraditional markets, folks. I mean, look at, uh, you know, Bowling Green, Kentucky there, number 13. Who would have ever thought that that would be the fastest, one of the fastest growing markets in the country? Or my personal favorite, number nine, Sioux City, where the only growth in Sioux City was the Hispanic population. The non-Hispanic population actually declined. If I was doing business in Sioux City, Iowa, I would really be paying attention to this. And the growth of the Hispanic population is no longer confined to just the South and the Southwest. It's really growing North and East. This is a chart that shows the growth of the Hispanic population from 2000 to 2006 by county. The darker the green, the greater the growth. In fact, the darkest green means a doubling of the population or more. So as you look at places like Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., you can see that those are places where the population has doubled or more in the last in, in six years. Look at North Dakota. I mean, granted, that means that there were four Hispanics and now there's eight, but still. <laughs> the Hispanic population isn't just growing in size this way, folks. It's also growing in size this way in terms of affluence. Latinos now have the greatest purchasing power of any ethnic minority, and the average Hispanic household income is $52,725. And I think that we would all agree that that is a decidedly middle class income. But it's not just about lumping all Hispanics into one group. No group is like that. Men aren't like that, African Americans aren't like that, and the Hispanic population is no different. It is, in fact, about understanding the Hispanic population from acculturation, not assimilation. Now, a lot, of these, a lot of people use these two words interchangeably, and they really shouldn't. They mean totally different things. Assimilation means I forfeit my culture, and I adopt yours. Right? I forfeit my culture, and I want to be like you. But acculturation means I forfeit nothing. There's certain things I really like about your culture, and I want those. But there's certain things I really like about my primary culture, and I want to keep those too. It's not about either or. It's about and. So let me give you the million dollar slide here. This is what my company gets paid big bucks for. It's the Latino acculturation stratification model. Sounds like a mouthful, right? But let me walk you through four Latino mindsets of acculturation. And nowhere on this chart are you going to find demography. You won't find age, sex, income, education, things like that. What you're going to find is language and values. And I'm going to take you from the least acculturated to the most. The other thing I want to point out is that you're going to find that these labels are very literal. The cultural loyalist, for example, is loyal to their primary culture. So let me explain. The cultural loyalist is defined as the foreign-born Latino who is a recent arrival. They've typically been in the United States for less than five years. They're Spanish-dependent or Spanish-only. 
They're going to consequently live among other Spanish-speaking people, work among other Spanish-speaking people, and tend to live their whole little world in what we call often Little Mexico or the high-density Hispanic neighborhoods. And they tend to bring with them traditional values. By that, I mean like male breadwinning uh, father and a, and a female uh, mother who stays home and takes care of the ch children. The next level over is the cultural embracer. The cultural embracer is also foreign-born, but the key difference between this person and the loyalist is that this person has adopted the U.S. as their new permanent home. They have no illusions about going back. They've come here, and they know that this is where they're going to live for the rest of their lives, and that's why they're called an embracer. Because if you moved to a foreign country tomorrow, and you didn't have a visitor mentality, you just wanted to live there, you would make new friends, you would try new foods, you would listen to new music, you would start to put down roots. So they're foreign born, but the U.S. is their home now, but they're still Spanish preferred, even if they're bilingual, and there's no guarantee that they're gonna be bilingual, but even if they're bilingual, they're gonna be Spanish preferred. Why? Because they're foreign born. Spanish is their mother tongue, it's always gonna be easier for them, and they're very aspirational and working hard to get ahead. The next level over is the cross-culture. The, co the cross-culture is U.S. born, but they're the first generation U.S. born. So mom and dad are either cultural loyalists or cultural embracers, right? Mom and dad are foreign born, and this is the first generation U.S. born. They're growing up in this country not only bilingually, but biculturally. And that's very important because anybody in this room could learn another language and become bilingual, but you can't just learn to be bicultural. That's just something that you are equally comfortable in the Latino and the non-Latino world. And they're very professional and they tend to be very much in touch with their Latin roots. Again, how could they not be? Mom and dad are foreign born. And the last level of acculturation is the cultural integrator. This individual is US born, but they're the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation Latino and beyond. English preferred here, or maybe English only, and yet very Latino proud. And into what we call retro acculturation. This group is fully acculturated, so what's happening is that they're suddenly very proud of their heritage and their roots, and many of them are really recognizing what a professional asset it is to be Hispanic, especially if they have some language skills. So the guy who 20 years ago, you know, was begging his mom, mommy, please don't call me Jose anymore, can you just call me Joey like the other guys? Well, now maybe it's okay to be Jose because it's such a professional asset. And influential, they tend to be having, holding positions of high positions in their communities, et cetera. So let me point out to you that both from a customer standpoint and your workforce standpoint, you can imagine and you can see that the needs of the cultural loyalist would be dramatically different than the needs of the cultural integrator. As a foreign born, you know, recent arrival, the cultural loyalist is gonna be dependent on Spanish. So if your shop is in one of those areas that is high density Hispanic with a lot of recent arrivals, you're gonna to wanna to have somebody on staff who speaks Spanish and et cetera, et cetera. Now you might also ask, well, what's the breakdown? You know, like what percentage of the population is which? 8% of the population is what we call fully acculturated. 8% is the cultural integrator. 23% of the population is fully unacculturated. 23% is the loyalist. The vast majority, almost 70%, are those two profiles in the middle of what we call partially acculturated. Diversity is a business opportunity. It is a business opportunity for three reasons. First of all, the opportunity to grow your business through new customers, which is purely incremental. You will continue to have the customers that you've always had. You will keep on keeping on. But if you add in a new customer base, whoever they are, that's incremental growth. Also, new employees. If you do bring on Spanish-speaking employees, Russian-speaking employees, whatever, then you are gonna also find that that imp improves employee retention and higher satisfaction and loyalty rates internally and externally. Let me tell you a quick story. Diverse employees can in fact really help your customer retention. There's a Toyota dealer that was telling me a story about an affluent Hispanic customer who, was co who asked to see a manager before he would commit to buying a Land Cruiser. The Land Cruiser I believe is what, $65,000? So this was a very well qualified buyer and he wanted to see a manager. He'd had all of his demo and he'd had his application and he'd taken the test drive and everything. He's ready to do the deal, but before he was ready to actually commit, he said, I'd like to meet the sales manager. Sales manager came out, greeted the customer, and the deal was done. Why? Because the sales manager was Hispanic. And this Hispanic customer said, you know what? I wanted to make sure that you had Hispanics in management, not just in the rank and file. It's important to me to do business with a dealership where I see that people can actually ascend to positions of management. And he bought that car because of that. 
But diversity efforts are not just going to happen. You have to plan for diversity. Planning diversity efforts requires the first step being representation. The first step is always representation. It's going to be very hard for you to tap into the Hispanic market, for example, if you don't have somebody who's Hispanic on staff or you don't have someone who speaks Spanish. That first step is really important because in a truly diverse workforce, your employees feel challenged and fulfilled in ways that frankly were not possible in previous generations. If you think back just a few decades ago, look how far we've come in terms of employment. You know, women were not in the workforce in significant numbers 30 years ago. And the women that were in the workforce held only clerical positions. Disabled workers were not accommodated in any meaningful way. The workforce was racially stratified, and it was very difficult for minorities to get into positions of management, and the workforce was often very hostile to openly gay employees. So we're making strides in all of these areas, and that is good for your business. So let me speak with you now about some strategies for success. The first strategy that I would offer to you is to be relevant. You cannot connect with any new marketplace or any uh, new customer group or any new employee group if you're not relevant to them. You've got to figure out what do people want, and if you can possibly give it to them, give it to them. So let me give you an example. I think that most people in this room would agree that Target's doing pretty well, and most people would agree that Kmart's not doing all that well. And I've thought about that from a marketing standpoint. You know, why is that? I mean, Target is doing well, and they're, they're, they're expanding, and Kmart is closing stores all across the country. And my philosophy is that Target figured out what we really want and gave it to us. And what we really want is not cheap stuff. No, no, no. What we really want is style on a budget, right? Because it, so if you say to me, cute, uh, cute tank top, Kelly, and I'm like, I know, 12 bucks, Target. I'm bragging, right? Now imagine this, 12 bucks, Kmart. No, 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 no. It's got Kmart juice on it, no way. <laughs> The reason that that, doesn't, that that sounds funny and you laughed is because, frankly, it seems ridiculous to brag about getting something at Kmart because there's no value with dignity there. There's no dignity. We all like to save money. We all like a good deal, but we don't want to be embarrassed about it. So what Target did is they figured out that just because you're on a budget doesn't mean that you don't have good taste. Just because you're on a budget doesn't mean you don't appreciate good design. So they figured out how to bring cool clothing and neat household, uh, household knickknacks and make them really, really inexpensive. So we get high design at low prices. And what Kmart did was put their stake in the ground on cheap. They said, people want cheap stuff. So they've got cheap real estate. They're in kind of grungy parts of town. They've got cheap lighting, cheap flooring. You know, if you go to pick a, a, a shirt off the rack, the rack falls down. The whole thing's cheap. That's not cool. And we don't want that. What we want is style on a budget, and we want that value with dignity, and that's why Target is relevant in our lives. You also have to be authentic. You've actually got to get to know your customer, and, the, and certainly the prospect that you're not getting but that you want to get, and you actually need to understand their lives. I don't know if you've ever seen henna. Henna is this picture of these hands here. Henna is applied to the hands and feet of Asian Indian women when they get married. It is just as important to the wedding look as in modern American uh, mainstream middle class culture, the wedding dress with possibly a veil is. It is part of the wedding look. And as you can see, it's very elaborate. It takes hours to apply that. It's applied to the hands and the feet. And so consequently, because it takes hours, for many Asian Indian women, when they have this applied right before their, their wedding, they bring all of their girlfriends to the salon to have this done, and they bring wine, and it turns into like a little bachelorette party because they'll all sit around and drink wine and gossip and while the bride gets this done. So I go to an Asian Indian salon in Dallas, and I'm usually one of the only white women in there, and I know about this, and I was looking through a magazine one day, and I see an ad for a national chain, I believe it was David's Bridal. David's Bridal, and I'm looking through this magazine, it's clearly targeted to Asian Indian women. I can't even read the magazine, because it's not in my language, but I'm looking at it, because I'm always interested in stuff like this, and I see this beautiful ad for this beautiful woman, and she's got a wedding sari on. And I thought, how cool is that? Like, you know, David's Bridal is going after the Asian Indian market. How cool is that? There's a wedding sari. So I go to the owner, because I've been going there for a while, and I pointed out to her, and I said, check this out. Look at this cool ad with the wedding sari. And she looked over my shoulder, and she said, yeah, but you can totally tell that a non-Indian made this ad. And I said, how can you tell? And she said, she doesn't have any henna on her hands and feet. She looks naked to me. Folks, it was an ad for a dress. If you look at a dress and you see nakedness, there's kind of a problem there. 
You know, they didn't, she couldn't get past the fact that this woman had no henna on her hands and feet. It was like she was wearing nothing because it looked so inauthentic to her. So again, an A for effort, but like an F for S execution. You also have to build your infrastructure, and you've got to look at your infrastructure relative to diversity efforts. Diversity efforts will require that you look within and see how you might need to build your business. Principal Financial Group shared with us that their, uh, among their account holders, these are not people who are trying to open an account, they're people who already have accounts, and the, who, the people who call in with questions, that their average call in English lasts between six and 10 minutes. Their average call in Spanish, 32 minutes. So even though their call volume for Spanish calls is significantly lower than their call volume in English, if the calls themselves take five or six times as long, then wouldn't you possibly need to adjust your Spanish-speaking operators versus your English-speaking operators and accommodate that? The Angelica Theater in Dallas, where I live, is an art house film place. And if you think about the, their business, that's a tough business. What's the deadest time of the week for the movie business? Mornings. Even the seniors don't come out till the afternoon, right, for the matinees. And yet you have everything, right? You got the milk duds, you got the popcorn, you got the movie, you just don't have any customers. So they were really smart and they said, wait a minute, what about new moms? What about new moms? Just because you've had a baby doesn't mean that you're no longer interested in film. You're the same woman, still have the same needs and interests and likes and dislikes, but now you've got a baby. So it's going to be harder for you to get out of the house and go see a movie. But boy, if there was ever anybody who needs to get out of the house, it's a new mom, right? She's climbing the walls. But it's problematic because now I've got this baby and I want to go see a movie and it's kind of hard. I've got to figure out the child care thing. And if I don't figure out the child care thing and I go to the movie theater and I bring my little baby and my baby starts fussing, then people go, shh, and they hate you, right? So they don't go. They just don't go. It's just too much hassle. So this particular uh, art house film place opened up a new thing called the Crybaby Matinee. 11 o'clock in the morning, timed for baby's first nap. No men allowed so that women can breastfeed comfortably. Baby changing area in the back of the movie so that if you have to change a diaper in the middle of the movie, you don't have to miss a minute of the movie. And you know what? If your little loved one starts fussing during the movie, chances are the other mothers are going to be completely sympathetic, right? The place is absolutely packed. And then it got so packed that one of the things that they hadn't thought of from an infrastructure standpoint is, oh, wow. What do we do with all these strollers? Because these women have these badass strollers, right? <laughs> Those things are huge. And these women all come. I mean, you've got a movie theater with 200 women in it, and they've all got these strollers. That, so they had to create an entire area of the parking lot for stroller parking. Really. And there's a guy out there that watches the strollers, and they have stroller parking on Tuesdays. But they thought about it from an entire infrastructure standpoint. And now they've turned 11 o'clock in the morning on on Tuesdays from a dead time of the week revenue-wise to one of the most busy times of the week. And those women come back week after week after week after week because they have two powerful things in common. They're, they're newborn uh, moms and they're lovers of film. Also, know your target, folks. Know your target. Like I showed you with the henna and the Asian Indian, it's really easy to go wrong, so make sure that you do your homework. You know, there's, a, there's an example of a wireless company. Probably a third of you in this room have them. They're big, they're national, you know them. And they came to us several years ago and asked for some help with the Hispanic market, and they said, you know, we know we need to do something. We did something a few years ago in Miami, and it just bombed, and so we, need, we know we need to try again. Can you help us? And I said, well, what did you do? And they said, well, we did this big Cinco de Mayo promotion in Miami, and it just bombed. And I said, well... Cinco de Mayo is a Mexican holiday. Miami's mostly Cuban. Maybe the Cubans don't give a flip about the Mexican holidays. <laughs> when was the last time you showed up for a Canadian Boxing Day? You know, it's not your holiday. You don't care. You don't even know what it is. And they made a classic mistake of thinking, oh, it's in, you know, it's in Spanish, therefore it's one size fits all, and not really understanding what that day is about. A better example of knowing your target is Bank of America wanted to partner with AT&T to tap into the huge Asian population in San Francisco, which is one of the largest Asian markets in the country. So they did a co-promotion where if you opened up a new checking account at Bank of America, you got an AT&T calling card preloaded with calls to Asia. Not Latin America, not Europe, Asia. Because chances are you have loved ones in Asia. And if you were an AT&T customer, they gave you free checking at Bank of America. Their goal was to open 1,500 new accounts. They opened 22,000. How'd you like to be the person who's like, yeah, that was my idea, yeah. That was me. Beep, beep, just bring the bonus truck right up to my desk, yeah. 
Also, I think it's extremely important that many of you train for cultural sensitivity with your employees. You can be the best employer in the world, you can be the best boss, you can have the best intentions, you can do it all right, and your employees can blow it for you. Okay? And so, consequently, if you embark on any kind of new diversity efforts, internally or externally, you have to be mindful of what they can and can't say. You have to be artful about it. There's a, there's a lot of blunders about this, folks, and people who ought to know better, don't. There's a law firm in Kansas City that is predominantly white, and they are making huge, huge efforts to diversify their partners and their associates because they know they have a problem. They know that they are not representative of the future going forward. So they are making huge diversity efforts. Their heart is in the right place. And one of the things that they do with their senior partners is they match their senior partners up against, uh, up with minority associates for mentoring because they want these people to do very, very well. So a partner who is an older white gentleman was taking one of the young associates who's African American out to lunch. And they go to lunch and the older white partner says, so tell me, where are your people from? Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> and the young man says, Kansas City. And the older partner says, no, no, but, but where are your people from? And the young man has no idea what he's talking about. He thinks, well, maybe he's talking about my grandparents. Or and he said, Kansas City. My whole family's from Kansas City, always have been. And he said, oh, no, no, I'm talking about what tribe in Africa are your people from? A law firm. <laughs> they could get sued for that. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Or, you know, these types of comments that we hear in, uh, in focus groups all the time. You know, talking louder does not make me bilingual. <laughs> also, pay attention internally. You need to make sure that your diversity efforts are working, and you need to make sure that your employees have all of the skills and the tools that they need to succeed. It's not just about saying, OK, we want to diversify our workforce racially and ethnically and gender-wise and uh, gay and lesbian and gen you know, generationally or whatever, and then we're going to have a diverse workforce and then be done with it. Monitor the situation, folks, and make sure that people have what they need to be, to be successful. Bank of America found that many of their Asian employees were not speaking up in meetings. And they were frustrated by this because they'd gone out and they had recruited the best and brightest that they could find. And they were talking to these employees and they were like, why aren't you speaking up in meetings? We hired you because we want your contributions. We want your brain power. We want your ideas. But you're not contributing. You're not speaking up in meetings. What's holding you back? And what they found was that an employee focus group revealed that many were actually very shy about having accents and they were afraid of being misunderstood. But folks, that's a pretty easy problem to fix. What they did was develop and offer accent reduction classes for anybody who wanted one. But if they hadn't been paying attention to that and in fact taken steps to say, hey, what's holding you back? Why aren't you contributing? They would have never known that that was the issue. Recognize different needs, too. It's not one size fits all. Different workers have different needs. Different customers have different needs. CVS pharmacies, I'm sure you all know who they are, have over 110,000 employees. When you have that many employees, folks, your workforce is going to be diverse. And not just racially and ethnically, but diverse with students who work there, senior citizens, and working moms in their 30s and 40s. Their managers are taught to understand the different values of those workers and why they're working in the first place. Students are working so that they can have some pocket money and some spending money for school. Senior workers are not needing the money as much as they need the health benefits and the coverage. And working moms are working because they need flexible hours and flexible schedules to take care of their families. The way that you would motivate these three different groups would be totally different based on the reasons that they're working in the first place. Now, I want to share with you some industry insights from your peers. Keenan Autobody, Mike Lavasser, the Vice President and COO of Keenan Autobody in Clifton Heights, Pennsylvania, shared this with me. He's got nine shops in the Philadelphia area and a large Russian and Korean community. And he said, we use the specialty newspapers for both recruiting and marketing to these communities to penetrate those markets. And we work with an insurance agent who is Korean, and she's great about suggesting us to her clients because she knows that we can work with her clients in their preferred language. So how great is that? So I'm on the phone with Mike, and I said, well, that's absolutely awesome that you have Russian-speaking employees and Korean-speaking employees. How do you find them? How do you find them? And he said, we hire on skill, of course, but we also look for techs who can speak these languages or are part of these communities. Furthermore, he added that some of the techs 
that we want to hire don't actually have their immigration documents in order. We have an immigration attorney on retainer who helps them get on the right path, and when their paperwork is ready, we're ready. We're ready to hire them. And I was blown away by that, folks, because I thought, here is a guy who is actually taking diversity entirely through his organization. It's not just about hiring those individuals. It is about making sure that you have an infrastructure that says, OK, well, if the paperwork's not in order, but you have the skills, and you're possibly going to have the certifications that we need, and the only thing standing between you and a job at my, my shop is your paperwork, I've got a resource here that you might not have. And he retains that, because he's looking for good talent. Auto Body Masters in Culver City, California. I spoke with Norman Larson. And he said having diverse employees, especially those who speak another language, is definitely a plus. Presently, insurance companies inquire about whether we have staff who speak other languages other than English to help them communicate with their insureds. And he said we have technicians and estimators who are all bilingual, and our ability to serve all of our customers is critical to the future of our business. Layman's Garage in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Daryl Amberson, you might know him too, he was on our panel discussion yesterday. And Daryl's had something very interesting to say. He said, the diverse customers for us are only comprising about 5% of our business today. But it's 5% that we didn't even have a few years ago. It's a growing aspect of our business. And I think every repair shop needs to figure out how their local community is changing, who their customers and their prospects are, and figure out how to reach and serve them. And I really want you to take this comment to heart, because I think that for many of you, you might be in a community where you're starting to see a change a little bit, but it, maybe it's not a huge change. It's not a tidal wave of change. And you're thinking, it's pretty easy to dismiss this, because it's only 1% you know, of our business or 2%. But I think Daryl hit the nail on the head when he said, it's 5% of our business that we didn't have a few years ago. And that 5% of the business, mark my words, that's going to soon be 10% of his business, and then 20, and then 30. And then you're going to need those customers, and I don't think any one of us are in a position today to not take every piece of business that we can get. Folks, diversity efforts are worth it. They're worth it. But don't take it from me. Take it from one of your own. Again, Mike said, don't be afraid of taking steps toward diversity efforts. It is extra work, but it results in greater loyalty with both your customers and your employees. Finally, I want to leave you with some thoughts going forward. I don't think that you should think that diversity is something you need to get ready for. I don't think that you should feel like, ooh, I got to get ready for this, I got to prepare. It's coming. Folks, it's already here. Every single day, in your communities, in your shops, with your workers, with your customers, whatever, you're already working with diverse groups. You already are. You've just got to make, make sure that you're paying more attention to this going forward as a true aspect of an ongoing part of your business. It's got to be part of your business plan. It can't be an afterthought, and it can't just be something that happens. But diversity is here. So don't be afraid of it, because you're not afraid of getting up and going to work every morning. You're already doing it, and you're already doing it with your diverse communities and your diverse employees. So just embrace it, because it's here, and it's good for your business. It will drive your revenue growth, and it will drive your customer retention and your employee retention. It's also not a fad. This is not some little trend that is going to reverse itself. This is the way it is, and it is going to continue to be this way. And I think, again, as a local business, I don't know how you can actually be a successful local business and serve a local customer if you don't know who your local customer is. And your communities today don't look anything like they did 10 years ago, and they are not going to look anything like they look now 10 years from now. So I think you are duty-bound as small business owners and local business owners to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on in your communities. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your workforce. You owe it to your customers. And it's good for you. And that 2010 census that was taken this year is going to be published in February. And let me tell you, folks, there's going to be two major news stories that you're not going to be able to escape. They're going to be everywhere. And it's going to be like a tidal wave. And the first news story is going to be one in three Americans are not white. And the second news story is going to be about the explosive growth of the Hispanic population. What's going to happen when that 2010 census comes out is people who have not been paying any attention to the diversity in this country are going to start paying attention, and the arena is going to get much more crowded. But you have a window of opportunity right now and going forward to think about this and plan for this and build your businesses so that you're best able to capture the diversity opportunities that are around you and that have a significant competitive edge. Now, I want to talk to you about this piece of paper that is 
in your seats. All of you should have had a piece of paper here. And ASA is very committed to diversity, not just at this keynote here today, but going forward. And they want to make sure that you have the proper resources that you need as small business owners to succeed. So mark my words, you are not going to hear about this today and then not hear about it again. ASA is committed to your ongoing education and your knowledge and, your, and giving you the resources that you need. So here are some resources that you can access immediately, but you will also see more coming from ASA in the future at conferences and online, et cetera. And speaking of online, this presentation today will also be available to you online at the ASA website. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DuPont. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.